Hi guys, um, especially you doctors. Uh, I'm Philip Ross. I'm a wildlife photographer and naturalist from Bangalore. And uh, I grew up in a family that actually loved wildlife and that sparked my passion for wildlife. And ever since I got really interested in birds, I bought a camera to help me understand uh, more about what birds I'm seeing. And uh, slowly that got me really, really hooked onto photography and I decided to make it my career. And uh, now I run a company called the Outback Experience, which basically teaches photography to various kids, adults alike. And uh, I get to travel to various hotspots, wildlife hotspots around the world. And uh, today I'm here to talk to you about some cool tips and tricks that you guys uh, as doctors, whenever you all go out to a wildlife destination, or even just to take some good photographs um, uh, around your family or at a party or whatever, uh, you guys can take some really good tips and tricks to make some better Im images. Okay, so uh, let's get started, guys. So I'm not going to go very technical today because it's, I got, it's got about 30 minutes. So I'm going to help you guys understand how you can make better pictures, whether you're using a DSLR camera, the latest mirrorless cameras, or even your mobile phone. So the topic I'm going to be talking to you guys about today is something called composition. Now, uh, composition, guys, is how you can make your picture more pleasing to the eye, how you can make your viewer go, wow, that's insane. Uh, how you guys can say, uh, can basically get the viewer to really love your picture. So it's one of the most important aspects to photography. So now in photography, you realize that it's both a science and an art. Uh, you have to really know how to balance the scientific part of the photography part, purpose, as well as the artistic side. Now, when I talk about the science of photography, I talk about the camera, I talk about the settings, I talk about changing settings due to the light, uh, various different things like focusing, etc. And when I talk about the artistic side is how I get to tell a story through my picture, how I really, you know, when they say a photograph tells a thousand words, how I make those thousand words really, really say a, a big story in my photographs. So composition, guys, is one of the things that I pay close attention to when I take a picture. For example, looking at this lovely picture of this tiger coming out to drink water. Now, composition over here is all about where I placed the animal in the frame because I'm into wildlife photography, I'm talking about animals. But even if you're photographing, say, a person or any other subject, how, where you place your subject matter in the frame is all got to do with composition. Like you can see over here, I placed to the right of the frame, I, I included the reflection, I sort of waited for that moment for the tail to go up. And all those things brought it, sort of brought about what composition is. Now, when I talk about composition, the sort of definition to composition is the placement or arrangement of visual elements in a photograph, where you place what in the photograph. And that could make or break your images. I'm telling you guys, massive, massive difference can happen between a good composition and bad composition. Now, what does it help to do? It helps to balance an image, especially when you have an image where you have no control of the subject and say the surroundings, like, like a wildlife photographer. See, we can't tell the tiger little to the right, little to the left, uh, or we can't tell the snake to move little up higher up the tree, etc. We can't do that, right? So we have to compose in a way where you get this really nice balance in the picture. And that's something that you can really make a really cool difference by composing well. And also, it brings up emphasis on the subject. That oomph factor stands out when you place your subject well in the frame. And all got to do with the topic of composition. Now, like I told you, whether you're using a simple mobile SLR and a big lens, this topic will benefit you all. Because even with a mobile phone, you can move your camera around, et cetera, uh, your phone around to get that com composition as per what you want. So in composition, guys, there's something called the rule of thirds. Now, the rule of thirds is a really, really cool tip in photography. Basically, what the rule of thirds is, if you take a picture, you imagine this picture by dividing it into nine equal parts, okay? So you have two horizontal lines and two vertical lines. So basically you have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. You're dividing a photograph into nine equal parts. Now you wanna make sure that you wanna place your subject wherever these lines intersect. Now you can see in this particular grid, you can see there are four parts where the lines intersect. Now guys, these four points are called the power points of composition. Basically, if you take a photograph from now onwards, you should try and avoid placing your subject in the center. And that's what majority of us do. I'm pretty sure you go back and look at all your pictures. You're, you get, most of us have the habit of placing our subject bang in the center 
or to the extreme ends of the frame. Ideally, the rule of thirds tells you, hey, guys, you don't want to place your subject bang in the center. Place it on either one third of the frame where the lines intersect, preferably. And that's what the rule of thirds is all about. So it's a really cool way of representing your pictures. Like you can see in this picture of this lovely young Sabadal tiger from Bandipur. The tiger was walking out into the open area. And when I placed my subject, I moved my focus point to the left-hand side of the frame to one third of the frame. And I got this fantastic composition like you can see over here. Most of the time, like I told you guys, most of us tend to place our subject in the center. I would strongly not recommend that. It's not, it's not wrong, wrong. Uh, it's just that it looks more pleasing to the eye. It's more naturally aesthetic when you place your subject as per the rule of thirds. Now, also, I want to tell you that the rule of thirds is not a rule, really. It's more a guideline to photography. Now, I hope you guys know the difference between a rule and a guideline. Um, and I hope that you guys are following all your rules. But yeah, the rule of thirds is something that is, I think is a guideline. And if you follow it, it's a good thing usually. Now, Coming to some other pictures, like you can see of this beautiful bird called the Bayback Shrike, again from uh, another cool place um, called Banargata, uh, which is where I have a farm out there. And you can see over here, this beautiful Bayback Shrike placed slightly to the left of the frame, as per that rule of thirds, gives it that really cool balance to the picture is what I, I tend to feel. Likewise over here, a very, very endangered macaque called the lion tail macaque from a beautiful place called Valparai. Now, here, once again, I like the fact that there was an orchid on the, on the right branch, and I wanted to include that in the rule of thirds, as well as the macaque naturally went into the rule of thirds. So you can see here, it both of them beautifully sort of balanced out the image, and it really made it quite pleasing to the eye, like I hope you guys agree. The next beautiful picture is of an amazing animal uh, called the Racophorus lateralis. It's the Boulanger's tree frog. Now this gliding frog you find in many small pockets of the Western Ghats. And I got to see it on this beautiful looking flower. So when I placed it, once again, I remembered the rule of thirds and I decided to place it slightly to the right of the frame. It just brings out that wowness to the image. So likewise, guys, whenever you're taking pictures from now onwards, just try and place your subject as per one third of the frame. It really makes your pictures start to stand out. Now this really, really cool image I got of a leopard sniffing a rock in a place called Nagarhole. Now, this is not the Kabani side of Nagarole, this is the Kurg side of Nagarole at a place called Murkal. This leopard went onto the rock and, you know, started to smell the rock, probably trying to, uh, it got the smell of another leopard and tried to figure out what this smell was. And it bent down in this crouching posture, trying to smell it. And it was an amazing moment for me to capture. But at the same time, I wanted to follow the rule of thirds. Now, some of y'all may be thinking, how is this following the rule of, rule of thirds? Basically, guys, when a subject, whenever your subject is taking up a big percentage of your picture, there has to be a certain part of the animal in the center because it's taking up a big percentage of the picture. Now, your most important point of interest in any subject, be it a human or an animal, is always the face, specifically the eyes. Now, that should be where you want to follow the rule of thirds. So remember, that's a huge tip for you guys to make your portraits really, really stand out and it'll make your picture really, really start to pop. Now, even over here of this beautiful bird called the brown hawk owl, once again, I made sure that I played, made more emphasis for the eyes and basically placed it as per the rule of thirds. Not exactly, you can see in the point where the intersection is because it's quite a narrow bird, but more or less there. So you don't have to follow exactly at that point, but more or less at that one third section is very, very cool. Now, the reason why I said the rule of thirds is a guideline and not a rule is because you're not always, don't, don't necessarily always have to follow it because there are certain cases where you need to go against the rule of thirds. Like you can see in this particular picture of a really, really gorgeous bird called the white rump shama. Now in this particular bird, it's a bird with a really long tail. Now, I usually like to give more space where the subject's looking. So if I had to follow the rule of thirds in this particular picture, I would have had to place the bird's eye here to follow the rule of thirds. But then what would have happened to the poor bird's tail? I would have cut the tail and that would have made the picture really get ruined. So guys, it's always important to remember when you can do an exception to the rule of thirds and place the subject in the center, but include the entire tail. So even over here, you can see of this really big, big woodpecker called the white-bellied woodpecker I photographed in Kabini. Once again, you can see it's a quite, a, quite a tall bird, quite a long bird. And once again, if I had to place the bird's eye as for the rule of thirds here, I would have actually gone and cut the tail and I would have lost out a lot of uh, sort of balance in the picture. 
So my suggestion is it's okay to go against the rule of thirds in certain scenarios. The next topic for composition, guys, is something called sense of space. Now, in every photograph, there should be ideally two types of space, positive space and negative space. Now, ideally, whenever you place your subjects with the rule of thirds, you want to try and give more positive space and less negative space. So if you look at this beautiful uh, picture I got of this beautiful bird called the blue cap rock thrush, once again, I'm pretty sure you're going to agree it's following the rule of thirds. But I decided to give two thirds of space on this direction compared to behind the bird. And the reason why I did that is because whenever you want to, you want to, whenever you think about positive space, it's always where your bird is looking towards, your animal is looking towards, your animal is walking towards, your subject is running towards. That is what is positive space. What is behind your subject is called negative space. Now, think about this, guys. You take your own hand and cover the part of the picture. Uh, on your own computer in front of the bird's eye and try and imagine more space behind it, you'll probably realize that it's probably better to see the picture like this rather than having more space behind it. This is what's called positive space. And my uh, sort of understanding of photography is that most pictures look nicer when you have more positive space. But you could try out some images with negative space as well. And see how it looks. Maybe it's pleasing to your eye and it works for you. But 99.9% .9 of the time, positive space does work a little bit better than negative space. Even over here, guys, once again, of the lion tail macaque from Valparai, I decided to give more space towards where the, bird, where, the, where the animal is looking. And that's how I got the picture to really, really start to pop. So rule of thirds and sense of space is something that you want to think of. Even over here, now I shoot with a 500 mm lens. I don't know if you guys are aware, but the more and more this number, 500 mm, 600 mm, set, but the more and more the zoom. Now, this is a prime lens, which means I can't zoom in and zoom out. It's fixed at one focal length. So it's very hard to compose for me. Now, you can see over here, this tiger cub was crossing the road. So I had the 500 mm and I couldn't really try and see how I can move the, uh, uh, the animal in the frame too much more. So even with really, really long zoomed in lenses, even here, you should try and remember, you want to try and include more positive space, but at the same time, do not cut the tail. So make sure you're, even though you're going almost to the edge of the frame, don't cut the tail. It's, re it's really quite a sick picture when you have the entire tiger, but the tip of the tail cut or a bird taking off and the tip of the wings cut. You know, it just doesn't make sense. These pictures, try and see how you can make your subject fit in the frame and it'll make your picture look much nicer. Here's a, a couple of examples of positive space versus negative space. You can see here in the picture on the right hand side, you can see where he, over here, the positive space really makes the picture sing a little bit nicer. And over here, it doesn't seem to be as good looking. Even over here, you can see here guys, placing your subject matter just on either side of the frame makes a big difference in what is right and what is wrong and what is more pleasing to the eye. But remember guys, even though I have said correct and incorrect, this is according to me. But if you're a type of photographer who prefers this method of photography, so be it. It's all your own creativity. And that's what keeps the photography flame alive, having your own creativity out there. Awesome. The next thing about composition is when to go vertical and when to go horizontal. A big dilemma when you're shooting, when to move your camera and shoot a, a, a vertical frame, frame or come back down to a landscape oriented or horizontal frame. Now, it all typically has to do with the subject matter. If your subject is usually taller than wider, close to you, a vertical frame makes more sense. An example of this would be an elephant. Now imagine an elephant is walking head on towards you and the elephant's pretty close. You would definitely wanna make sure you go and shoot a vertical composition because then you'll get some nice space above the elephant, some decent space below the elephant and there's not required too much space on either side. So a vertical picture would look really, really cool. But if you were to try to take a horizontal frame here, you would almost cut the top of the elephant, you would almost cut the tip of its toes, and you'd have unwanted easel space on either side, which doesn't make sense. So remember, guys, it's very important to choose when to go vertical or horizontal. Another super example of this would be when you're going to shoot, say, a, a New York skyline, Empire State Building. That's when a vertical frame would look really, really good, just the Empire State Building. But if you want to photograph the entire skyline, that's when a horizontal frame would make more sense. So remember this because it could make or break your picture really, really easily. So a couple of examples here, you can see here, this picture of these two rat snakes in tussle. These are two male snakes in combat. And it's a really cool thing to see that it's not very, very, uh, you know, full of blood and gore, et cetera. It's quite 
quite cool watching them. It's almost like a dance. And uh, usually whichever snake pins the other snake's head down is the victor. And uh, it takes over the territory. Now, I was watching this amazing dance happening in Kabini. And uh, luckily, this was in the parking lot. So I could be on my on my feet. I was, in, I was parking the car and I saw this thing happening. So I took my camera out. I lay on the ground to get that beautiful blurred out background. And uh, I went vertical because, firstly, this, look, look at the depth of field in the grass. You couldn't see the grass in total focus. So the remaining part of the snake was going to be blurred anyway. And this was such a nice, important, uh, such a nice posture to play around with your pictures to make it look much better. A tall bird, a tall bird looks great when you go vertical. This uh, bird called the uh, Malabar trogan looks fantastic. And it's a tallish bird. So going vertical when it's close to me made a lot more sense to make the picture stand out. Head-ons, guys, when you get a head-on of a tiger, a leopard, whatever, remember when the animal starts walking towards closer to you, go vertical. It just totally revolutionizes how your picture is going to look. And you can see in this lovely picture of this big Baswan Kate male of Bandipur, a head-on frame really made the picture look super. Another head-on opening I got from Corbett uh, really made the picture really cool as well. And uh, I positioned the vehicle in such a way where I could get this slight dip in the road behind the tiger, making the background nice and blurry as well. So that was another cool thing that I used in my composition. Now, I've had the pleasure of photographing many big cats uh, uh, walking towards me as a head-on. Another cool opening was this leopard from Kabini once again, walking on an on a old main road called the Old MM Road. And uh, I waited for the moment as he was walking towards me, and I loved how he put his tail up. So I used that part as my rule of third because that was my interest. And uh, I kept the, uh, the, the eyes of the, of, the, of the leopard more or less in the center. But the main part was the tail in that lovely posture that gave me the uh, sort of gave me the reason why I kept that part of the rule of thirds. And of course, the black panther. Now, the black panther is an animal that is so enigmatic. It's such a cool animal. And I know a lot of you guys would want to go to Kabiri to see this animal. I'm, I'm sure that a lot of you have seen him as well. And uh, once again, he's just such an amazing animal. The next time he walks head on towards you as well, remember, go vertical, follow the rule of thirds. Lions and gear, once again, you can see here as well, going head on, uh, make it really, really worth it. A leopard smelling a tree and scratching a tree uh, gave me this really nice posture of the leopard going much taller. And that's why I went vertical in this particular case. Portraits, portraits look wonderful when you go vertical. And once again, remember to keep the eyes in the rule of thirds, which is very, very important. A couple of few more examples, two elephants walking towards me. A lion-tailed macaque and see once again the eyes in the one third of the frame. I love this photograph that I got of a really long shot of uh, these elephants going into the tea or coming back from the tea to enter the forest. And uh, the, this part of the forest had a, had a very, very burnt out section because of some uh, tea, tea control. That's why I went vertical here to avoid that distraction and make it look very pleasing over here. To the eye. Choosing the right focal length is another massive uh, sort of uh, cool tip for photography. Now, most people, when we buy a camera, we buy a lens, we think that our best pictures are when we zoom in the most. And that's not the case, guys. Sometimes zooming out and including the habitat would make your pictures much nicer. So my tip to you guys is if you're a fan of getting close-up shots, so be it. Get your close-up shot, but don't only get what one perspective of that, of that frame the whole time. Sometimes zoom out and see, including habitat, how the picture will look. Or going to a middle zoom, try and bridge the gap between both of them and see how that would look. Don't just shoot in one zoom the whole time, one magnification the whole time. Try and zoom out a little bit here and there, zoom out completely, shoot with a wide angle. You may like those pictures even better. So a few cases where the zoomed out version looked a lot nicer was here. I shot this picture with a 70 to 200 mm lens of this amazing, beautiful morning covered in mist show that lovely mood to the picture of these elephants with with their uh, with or going on an elephant people going on an elephant safari in kaziranga and it was just such a beautiful uh, morning to see and include the entire habitat and once again you can see all the things that i paid attention to rule of thirds sense of space and choosing the right focal length really made the picture start to pop here once again i had this wonderful opportunity to shoot this beautiful leopard on a tree now i could have zoomed in even more and got only the leopard but that would have been just a very, very blah image. Here, I love the fact that look how beautiful this tree is covered in moss. I love that backlight, slightly backlight. I loved how the greenery in the image was. So zooming out here made the picture rather than zooming in. So this is what I'm trying to tell you is, doesn't mean you get your best pictures only when you zoom into the maximum always. Try and zoom out, constrain yourself a bit. You may make a much, much nicer composition. 
Here, once again, I got this wonderful silhouette of these spotted deer crossing a sandbar going to an island in Kabini. Uh, and it was just such a beautiful moment to zoom, to zoom out, get that lovely uh, hill in the background, those lovely dry trees, and get the, the cheetah or the spotted deer silhouetted in the frame. Another cool case where I got to see this picture, or I got to photograph this uh, lovely animal called the Nilgiri Thar amongst these really cool flowers called Kurunji flowers. Now, for some of you guys out there, you know that Kurunji flowers is a flower that blooms once every 12 years. So I photographed this in 2018. So the next time this is possible is only going to be in 2030. But what's so cool about it, I positioned the tar in a way where I could get the tar in the one third of the frame, the rule of thirds, give the sense of space, lovely clouds as well, but also have these beautiful flowers in the other positive space part of the picture. So it really made a, a nice frame out there to have this entire scene. Once again, zooming out made the reason why this picture really sang. I had this beautiful opportunity docs of an elephant, a group of elephants, a tiger, and a peacock in the frame. But what I love about this frame is not that, of course, I have these three amazing creatures out there, but I loved how the canopy of these trees and the surrounding foliage created like a natural vignette to the frame. And I used that to frame my picture. I loved how that foresty feel sort of made a tunnel-like view for this lovely view going on. And it really made the picture nicer. One of, my, one of my favorite pictures that I've ever taken is of uh, this elephant walking through this lovely, moist, deciduous part of the Nilgiris. And um, to have a waterfall in the frame along with the elephant really, really made that balance really cool. And it's also a, a beautiful picture that represents what uh, conservation is all about. To conserve these animals, you not only have to conserve the water, you have to conserve the plants, you have to conserve the entire biodiversity as well as the animals. All of this telling a story in one picture. So that's what composition is all about. Now, when you're photographing a small bird, that's when if you shoot with a zoomed out lens and zoom shoot wide angle, you, people, your, your viewers will go, hey, what's that? Um, can't tell, man. It's too, too small in the frame. But here's where you need to have those 600 mm's and 800 mm lenses. Because when you photograph these small birds, you need to show that beauty in them by zooming in. So sometimes I have to shoot zoomed in to show these small birds looking really pretty in the frame. A beautiful bird called the black nip monarch. Likewise, another beautiful bird called the yellow browed bulbul. Once again, you can see rule of thirds, sense of space, all that in my frame looking wonderful. Uh, I had that, remember you saw that picture of those two lines walking head on in earlier in the, in the vertical or horizontal? The same scene, one line went inside and came out at this beautiful spot where it showed these lovely flame of the forest flowers on the ground, sort of like a red carpet. And here's where I shifted from going vertical to going horizontal because both these lines came out in the frame as well. So it, you, you have to be aware of when to sunny shift from going vertical to horizontal to make your composition much nicer. Now, when you get too close to your subject, right? Some people say, hey, I have a 500 mm, I can't zoom out, so what do I do? Shoot, but compose in a way where you don't where you cut into the animal, but don't make the cut scene accidental. You can see this picture of this lovely peacock dancing. Now, it was so close to me that this is making it my entire frame. But I composed it in such a way where I had the, the head and the eyes in the one third of the frame, showing more background of the, of, the, of the feathers and that dancing posture, giving it a nice composition. Uh, here's where you can cut into the animal and it doesn't seem accidental. What I'm trying to say is don't take, like I said, don't take the entire tiger, but tip of the tail. If you want to cut into the tiger, zoom only to its face. That would be a nicer composition. Like over here, this tiger was doing this incredible sort of behavior called Fleming response. And uh, it was sticking out his tongue, making this really cool face to kind of uh, get the scent to go up into its, Flem uh, into its Jacobson organ. And I zoomed into a way just to its face to get this wonderful shot of the tiger snarling. Or not snarling, but doing the Fleming response. But here you can see, guys, every tiger has its own stripe pattern, like our fingerprints. Every fingerprints are, are unique. Now, every tiger's stripe pattern is also unique. What's really cool about this particular tiger is he's got C-A-T written on his forehead. He's got cat all around his forehead, which is really, really cool. The next is this beautiful leopard with blue eyes. Once again, zooming in to make the cut seem accidental. Uh, 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 like, don't make it seem accidental to make it look really, really nice in your frame. Now, this is pictures of showing animals in the frame where the animal is really small. Now, the new age of wildlife photography is showing habitat, but the animal big in the frame. Something like this, where you have this lion close up to you showing the animal big in the frame with the beautiful habitat. Now, how do you get this? Either two ways. One 
is remote control or camera trapping photography where you set up a camera with a wide angle lens and wait for the animal to come to trigger off the sensor and it takes its own picture or you get really close to the animal. So next time you get really close to your subject, like sometimes you're driving around the animal just on the side of the road and you're trying to drive past, that's when you shoot with a wide angle lens, show a lot of habitat, but the animal will still be big in the frame. It'll really make your pictures much cooler and nicer. So I love photography like this, where you're showing this beautiful animal with all details in the animal and the bird and the beautiful habitat it lives in. Even over here of this Himalayan marmot, once again, so you can see how close I am. This is the remote trigger. The animal was close to me. And then I had this beautiful background showing the habitat it lives in. Likewise, over here in Rantambo. The next thing with, uh, with composition is rule of horizon. Guys, whenever you hold your camera, don't hold your camera like this or like this. Keep it straight. Basically, you want to make sure your entire horizon is straight in one line. Some people try and tilt their camera here and there to try and make it think they're looking cool or whatever. It just doesn't make the picture look nice. You want your horizon to look absolutely straight. The next is choosing the right angle. Now, whenever you shoot a picture, guys, you want to choose the right angle depending on the light, the background, and something called eye-level photography. Huge tip for you. Whenever you're photographing something, try and go to the same level of the, of the subject. That would give your backgrounds much nicer appeal and it will make your picture look a lot better. Try this out, I'm telling you. So the, depending on the light, what's in the background, so you can move if the, if the background is distracting. And remember, eye level. As much as possible, eye level to make your pictures really, really cool. I had this wonderful opportunity to shoot this snake eating this fish. I lay on the ground to get that lovely eye level, but it really made the picture look nice. Here, once again, of this beautiful tortoise called the star tortoise, once again at eye level to make the picture really look nice. Sometimes positioning your vehicle in the safari makes a big difference. And that's why people like to come on our photography tours because we're always in communication with the driver. And I keep telling the driver forward, backwards, moving, using the undulating road basically to help us get eye level with the picture. Because you know, in a safari park, you can't get off and walk. So you have to use the vehicle and the roads up and down movement to try and position your vehicle in such a way so you can get a nice eye level posture, and which is really, really cool. Even over here, I almost lay on the side of the boat to try and get this lovely picture of this otter. Beautiful male leopard walking towards me, try to get as low as level as possible to try and figure out. One of my most prized catches is the black panther coming to drink water. Again, it was purely vehicle positioning that got us this frame, and it was just amazing to get to see this creature drink water for 10 minutes in front of us. A few more examples of, of tigers, of birds, etc. at eye level, choosing the right angle makes a big difference of how your picture is going to look in your frame. So I, you can see I love photographing birds and tigers and leopards. So um, this is one of the things I love going, to, going out to do. So next time you see, when you see a creature, an animal, remember going down an eye level makes your picture really, really pop. Whenever you see an animal with a reflection, when it's drinking water, whatever, don't chop the reflection. Include the entire reflection to really make your picture sing. Okay, like you can see over here, over here, over here, and over here. So it really makes your pictures start to look so much nicer when you include the reflection. So don't cut the reflection abruptly. It will really make your picture start to look nice. The final few things I have to talk to you about is something called capturing catch light. Now catch light is that sparkle or that twinkle in your subject's eye. Guys, this brings out a lot of life and emotion to the picture. When you capture that sparkle and how you can capture it just by moving yourself to get that reflection in the, uh, in the subject's eye to really start to sing. So this brings out, like I told you, a lot of life and emotion to the picture. So always try and look forward to capturing that sparkle in the eye. It'll really, really make your picture start to sing. So you can see everything we spoke about today from rule of thirds, sense of space, capturing catch light, rule of horizon, choosing the right focal length. All these tips I gave you guys will really make your pictures start to sing and really make your pictures stand out. And really, you'll become another, uh, a, a really, really good photographer in no time at all. So I hope that this particular class really benefited you to taking up uh, uh, photography in a better way, getting a little bit more encouragement to start, start shooting more better. And I'm pretty sure guys, in no time at all, y'all will start taking much better pictures. So uh, I'm sure that you can find me on uh, various social media networks if you want to get your questions sort of clarified or whatever. 
but we'll try and uh, answer some questions as well soon. Okay, thank you so much, guys. It was a pleasure uh, talking to you all, and I hope, wish you all the best and stay safe in 2021. Cheers. Really appreciate the way you have put it across straight and crystal clear, very crisp. Indeed, uh, our senior gastroenterologist, Dr. Matthew Phillips, has already congratulated you for the wonderful pictures. Undoubtedly, the entire Indian, the, throughout India, the gastroenterologists all across the India are watching this program. And uh, thank you very, very, very much for giving us a brief insight about photography. And I think uh, now the, uh, the, I think the verdict is very clear why I chose the photography as the hobby of mine, slowly turning into a profession. And having visited this uh, lovely place called Nagarhole Forest in Karnataka uh, more than 170 times. So wonderful. So now coming to the panel discussion, I have an eminent uh, uh, gastro surgeon here who is the chairman of the Karnataka State Chapter of the Association of Surgeons of India and a very well-known photographer. Doc, Professor Dr. Sadashiv Sopimath. Welcome, sir. He's from Hubli. And uh, with him, I have Dr. Sanjeev Chetney. He's, he's also a gastroenterologist, senior gastroenterologist from Hubli. And he's also a bird photographer. And I have Dr. B.R. Prashant, who's from Tumkur. He's a gastro surgeon. He's also a wildlife photographer. I welcome you three into the, into the panel. I am sure that Philip is also there in the panel. And uh, there are a lot of questions from most of us to Philip and to the rest of the panelists, like which camera to choose, which lens to choose, where to go to the sea to see a tiger, where to go and uh, photograph a bird, and with whom we should go, where we need to get accommodated, whether the food is good there, whether there are safari vehicles available there. Yes, some of these lovely the, I mean, questions, some of these questions will have, get some lovely answers. I think let's start with this uh, good uh, discussion on this. I'm, so I'm myself, I'm Dr. Arvind Gubi. I'm a uh, surgical gastroenterologist here in Bengaluru. I've been into this wildlife photography for over 10 years now. And, uh, and of course, I've been visiting a lot of general resorts throughout India. And Kabini in Karnataka, Nagarhole Forest is one of my favorite. Right now, as I told you earlier, I'm sitting inside this Kabini Forest jungle lodges and resorts. Uh, I'm in the deep inside the jungle here and uh, having sighted 10 tigers uh, from yesterday and uh, this morning. And I mean, I've taken more than 1,300 pictures of these tigers, as Philip said, I'm following the rule of thumb, I mean, the rule of third, the composition and everything. Now, the first question, which goes to Dr. Sadashu Sopimath, sir. Sir, what compelled you to choose this as your hobby? Uh, well, actually, during interaction, I had some friends, I used to shoot the birds from distance and all that. Initially, of course, I had an uh, interest in landscape uh, as a travel photography and all that with the family and all. But once in a while, I just shot the birds and saw that they look amazing on lens. And what actually you don't see from distance, the camera lens captures it. The nature has gifted the birds and is all these uh, things with so much beauty, so much colorful life. I think those colors, if you try to mimic in real life, they look so gaudy and so disturbing to the eyes. But they look so pleasant on, uh, to the eyes when you see these birds so colorful and all that. And the details, that they're much more, much more beautiful when you look, capture them in the lens and all that. And they do converse, they do express love, they do express anger, they do fight, they pamper their partners. So all this behavior, when they started looking closely, then I thought I must capture them in my uh, lens and enjoy them closely. And of course, I started using uh, uh, this binocular and also this lens. And that's how I migrated from a lower end camera to the higher end camera now, just to enjoy the birds, how they behave, how they look, the details, everything and all that. So I just love it now. Wonderful, wonderful, sir. I'm so glad to hear that. Now the next question to Dr. Prashant. So he's also into wildlife photography. Prashant, how do you relate this photography to your profession of gastro practice? And how often do you go and uh, start photographing these birds and wildlife? Dr. Yeah. Prashant? Uh, good evening. Yeah. yeah, good evening, everyone. Uh, it just started like uh, this one friend of mine called uh, Arun. 
of Bellari. He's also a gastro surgeon. I started uh, watching his uh, uh, pictures when he used to post on uh, uh, social media. And I used to some, feel some happiness in seeing these pictures. Then one fine day, I just started uh, uh, shooting myself with the handheld uh, small uh, point and shoot camera. Then as uh, Dr. Sophie said, it was the birds or uh, any nature. It used to look so beautiful and I used to feel uh, such ha immense happiness and peacefulness. And all my stress of the day used to go. And then I slowly started uh, uh, buying a new camera. I went into uh, getting trained with the whole people. And then uh, I bought a camera, uh, Nikon and then telephoto lens. And somehow it started like that. And I started enjoying once I'm into it. And then I learned about the composition. Uh, it was quite, it's something like, it was a fun for me. Uh, it was health benefit that I used to walk a lot suddenly to shoot birds and other uh, landscapes. Uh, it, it just started like that. And then finally, now I'm so much into it that every other Sunday I'm into the wild and I'm traveling. And I met so much of uh, good friends in this. Basically, That's a wonderful, Dr. Prashant. Okay, now the next question is to Dr. Sanjeev Chetni. He's a young uh, dynamic photographer today of uh, Hubli. Uh, Dr. Sanjeev, what compelled you to choose birds over the tigers and leopards? You're, more, you're, uh, you're a noted bird photographer. Yeah, Arvind, uh, I'm more comfortable with birds uh, rather than wildlife. Uh, I don't know, it was just a choice I made. Nothing particular, but I like birds most because it is easy they are easily accessible. We need not go to the safaris as you regularly go. And the majority of the birds are in and around us only. I mean, more than 80% of the birds what I have captured is in Hubli or surrounding Hubli. So we have to just open our eyes and uh, enjoy the nature. That's all. All right. Thank you so very much. Now, the most important question which most of the audience of the Delegates are waiting for to know from Philip. Philip, okay, this question is for you. Which camera to choose and what lens to be chosen? Can you please tell the audience how to how to select or choose if, uh, the camera and accordingly what lens does fit a camera? Because there are so many cameras today, like Canon, Nikon, Sony. I think I mean many people are so confused which to buy, where to buy, how to buy, what lens to buy. Please, please uh, uh, give a good insight on this, sir. Awesome. Sure, sure, Dr. Gubi. Um, basically, guys, um, choosing the right camera is like you guys going and choosing the right equipment to do your surgery and stuff. Like that. It's quite, quite a bit of a, a dilemma, right? What you choose, which kind of type of technology. But it all got, got when, you, when you go down to choose your camera, it all got to do with what type of photography you're interested in. So for... Most of us over here who are wildlife photographers, we want to choose lenses that have a good magnification. So choosing a lens with a good focal length, um, say 400 mm, 500 mm, 600 mm and onwards, would give us the ability to stay far from the subject, but still get a close intimate shot. So that's one of the first things that we look for, especially uh, for Dr. Sanjeev, who is a bird photographer, he definitely can't go really up close because the bird will fly away and he can't get to disturb the bird as well. So he can stay a little bit far and get, get some really, really awesome pictures. And that all got to do with choosing a longer telephoto zoom lens or a prime lens. So that's the first thing that you need to look for is what type of photography you're interested in. Now, if I'm a person interested in landscape photography, then I would have to choose a wide angle lens because that's the one that's going to give me that beautiful view of the entire mountainscape, etc. So that's that's something that I would recommend as well for so the, as the first choice. You first choose the type of genre of photography you're interested in. And then based on that, you choose a focal length or a type of lens that's going to suit you for that particular type of picture. So like I said, wildlife photography, the longer the telephoto lens, the longer the zoom, would give you a beneficial sort of moment. Yeah, Philip, uh, for a beginner, for a beginner, okay, who's an amateur in photography. I mean, yeah. today here, the, most of them have heard you, they've seen your pictures. From tomorrow morning, sunrise, they need to get into photography. What yeah, camera yeah. they have to pick up, where they need to pick up, 
I, I mean, do, do they have to purchase or as our cameras available for rental basis? Or I mean, where where to go? Can you please uh, uh, highlight this? Okay, sure. So basically, if you want, since you're going to most of you guys are going to start off your photography journey, buying a basic DSLR or a mirrorless camera was the first thing that I would recommend. So you, there's a lot of choice now. Doctor Gubi had mentioned is Canon better, Sony better, the, uh, uh, Nikon better. Basically, guys, Canon and Nikon are like Coke and Pepsi. Okay, it's a long debate in which one's better. Basically, they're both very, very good companies. And now Sony's entered the market as well, which are blowing people's minds away. And in their way, they can uh, showcase. So, basically, you want to buy any basic DSLR or mirrorless camera from either of the three brands: Canon, Nikon, or uh, Sony. Okay. Once you have that, then choose a basic lens as well. So you normally get something called a kit lens along with the camera system. That's good enough for your pictures at your social events or your parties or whatever. But if you're getting into wildlife photography, buy a basic 70 to 300 mm lens or a 100 to 400 mm lens. This would give you a good enough zoom for your and it's not very very expensive as well. Uh, now with so much of competition, uh, Nikon, Sony, and Canon have sort of reduced their prices for their basic equipment to help all of you guys. But if you guys want to really get out and get some of the latest massive focal length cameras, you can. Because you're doing one or two trips a year, maximum four, four or five trips a year, there's no point in buying, say, five lakh rupees or 10 lakh rupees worth of equipment and then keeping it in your cupboard. So what I would recommend for people who are just doing those one or two trips every three months, then you could rent equipment. So there are lots of rental companies right through India who have unbelievable equipment for very affordable rates that you can get high-end equipment. So buy a basic DSLR camera. You can buy it off Amazon. You can buy it off some good uh, stores in your city. Like in Bangalore itself, there are two stores. This guy called Jayesh Mehta who has a fantastic store. Uh, there's another guy uh, in Kanur in Kerala who has one of the cheapest places in India to buy equipment uh, called Photo Links. So there are lots of these cool stores out there. You can get really good camera equipment. Buy basic equipment first to learn how to use your camera system and then slowly progress once you feel you reach the saturation with that equipment. So, yeah, basically, uh, start off yeah. with something basic and then move on. Back. Very nice. So, okay, now I think you need to promise all our delegates that uh, you'll be one <laughs> point of contact for the information that you can provide them, provided if they can reach out to you. And Ab wonderful. Absolutely, yeah. no and problem. The most important all. question which is lingering in most of the people's mind is where to go to, uh, to, photograph, uh, to, uh, to have this photography made for the wildlife. So, which forest they need to choose first and whom to contact and where to stay. Because in Karnataka, I'm sure that Jingle Lodges and Resorts is one of the best outstanding, nothing to beat or match that. I think, I mean, I've been uh, 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 visiting this property for almost 170, uh, today, this visit is 170 yes, visit of mine. And uh, no doubt about it because the services and hospitality is fabulous. Likewise, there are many people across India whom, whom they should contact and how should they reach out for, for accommodations and for bookings. Yeah, so like you, you basically are the jungle lodges, guys, uh, in Karnataka. We had, we had people from all the people who are here from Karnataka are super blessed because they have lodges in some of the best tiger reserves in Karnataka. So, Bandipur, BRT, and Kabani, the golden triangle of wildlife hotspots, they have a lodge out there. So, reach out to them. Or oh, if you'd like for me to help you with the booking, you can contact me as well. And then basically, um, go out for at least two nights. I would don't rec don't go just for that one night and do two safaris and then judge the place. Give it at least four safaris at, uh, per trip. So you give yourself a good chance to go and see where the activity is at. But believe me, guys, the number one place I think in India per se right now to see a wild tiger is Kabini. Somehow the last few years, Kabini has been exploding with sightings thanks to these tigresses with their sub-adult cups. And because the tigress is so uh, habituated and so bold, the cubs are starting to get the same as the mother. They're not afraid of vehicles, etc. So, you know, 10 years ago when I saw a tiger in Kabini or even Bandipur, it would be five seconds max. You would see the tiger, the driver say, tiger, 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 tiger. And then one, two, three, four, five, tiger sighting over. <laughs> now, these days, you actually leave the tiger where it is and drive back because your timer is over for the safari. So, it's become like that. And considering the amount of time you spend in the park in South India, like for example, in Kabini, we have only three hours in the morning, three hours in the evening. It's very quite limited time, yet the amount of sightings people are having. Just look at, for example, Dr. Gubi. Two days, three safaris he's done, or four safaris he's done, and he's seen 10 tigers already, which is unbelievable, not heard of in the past. So if you want to see a tiger, you're living in Bangalore, go to Kabini. That's the best place. If you're up in the north, then places like Bandavgarh, 
places like Rantambo are two fascinating places as well for tiger sighting. For birds, like Dr. Sanjeev said, there are all sorts of cool places. Even right around your city, right in your backyard, you'll have some fantastic little water bodies, little forest trails, etc. You go over there, learn about the birds, and you'll see a lot of birds. So it's like I said, like he said very rightfully, it's much easier to please a birder than a tiger lover because you can never guarantee a tiger. You can always guarantee some good birding when you go out. So all depends on what you want to see. But like I said, guys, Kabini right now is an awesome hotspot. Um, go there in the next few months because also remember in our lifetime, remember that Black Panther picture I showed you? In the history of the world, there's never been a Black Panther like him. I, I repeat, in the history of the world. So so it's incredible that this animal has shown, started to show itself in our lifetime because in our grandfathers, our forefathers, I mean, there was never an animal like that, as habituated as that. So, and he's probably got just a few more years left before he passes on. So, make the best of it, guys. Go and try to track the Blackie because uh, you never know when another Black Panther is going to be like him. Great, Philip. One last question to you. See, uh, I, I mean, uh, photographers, budding photographers or amateurs needs a mentor. All right. I mean, they just cannot get into the jungle and uh, and start to I mean, uh, photograph. You know, they can start using the camera. Somebody needs to guide them. I mean, just like, you know, how we have a guide for an endoscopy and uh, for the skills, somebody needs, uh, I mean, uh, people need a guide. How do you advise them and like, whom should they contact and how for, I mean, basically they need a mentor. How will you support them? Yeah. So um, a lot of, a lot of us who were in growing up in the 1990s, 90, uh, in early 2000s, sort of learned by trial and error, going out and trying to find things themselves. But it was a long drawn process and it was much more much difficult. So yes, having a mentor right now who can show you some shortcuts will definitely help. So there are many companies, guys, in all the cities, I'm pretty sure in India, there are lots of little travel and photography, wildlife based companies that help you unveil your understanding of your camera, unveil your understanding, like basically mentor you in your photography. At the same time, take you to places where you're almost guaranteed to have some good sightings. So like my company, the Outback Experience, there are lots of other companies as well, which you can uh, find out about. And basically join one of our tours where we'll take you to the park, show you an insight to the park, give you a few tips and tricks, teach you how to use your camera, show you how we understand and take uh, who, who are our guides in the park, who are our drivers. Then the next time when you guys go, you can basically try and do the same or replicate what you are learned on your mentorship programs. So Wonderful. yes, I have a Wonderful. I have a website. I have a, tra uh, I have, I have a travel company that basically de does these cool things. Well. Are there any books or websites uh, for the for the people to choose? Yeah, there's actually lots of cool information. Like for example, for anyone interested in understanding bird calls, there's a super website called xenocanto.com. X-E-N-O hyphen C-A-N-T-O dot com where I learned a lot of the cool birds that I'm hearing and it gives you a chance to record the bird and try and figure out what uh, bird you're listening to. Likewise, there are some really cool pictorial guides to the snakes of India, to the uh, some uh, animals of South India, to the mammals of India, lots of cool different birds out there, uh, books out there that can really benefit you. So I'm pretty sure of you guys, just send me a WhatsApp or send me an email and I'll, I'll write back to you with the perfect information about which Fantastic. author. Fantastic, Fantastic, Philip. This is what I wanted to hear from you, how easily you will you'll be approachable. Hence, I, I mean, no you, you were the chosen one for this today's talk because of your <laughs> absolutely uh, down-to-earth personality for these kind of support. Thank you very much. And now the, the next question to Dr. Sopi is: So which camera do you use and which uh, uh, place do you visit for photography commonly? Uh, well, I have Nikon 850 and lenses. I have 300 prime and I have 18, 200. I have 500 prime and I also have 600 prime. But depending on the requirement, I use them. But most often I use the newer 500. And that also helps in my travel uh, uh, photography and all that. What all and places are you? Sir? Places most often we go around Hubli and Dandeli, of course, is the best place for bird photography and bird lovers and those who want to make a beginning to see a lot many birds. I think should visit Dandeli. Just stay there for a day or two. That's a wonderful thing. And I just keep traveling wherever I go for conferences or scientific meets. I don't make exclusive birding tours except one or two. But otherwise, wherever I go, I just choose a place nearby and try to see that surrounding place. For example, recently when I went to Odisha, Bhuvaneshwar, I went to Bhitar Kanika and I went to Mangal Jodi. So I just club 
few days or few, three four days along with my conference and just try to see around and go for a biding and to start i think there is one question which i just wanted to add that the newer point and shoot cameras with good zoom are also good just to carry around and all that they are very simple to use and start using them so you see what you like either it's a landscape or it could be bird or it could be anything you can use it for whatever purpose so you start loving the snaps and the look what you the pictures and all that depending on your choice then you can choose the camera as philip has rightly mentioned in that okay a fantastic sir dr chutney now the important most important question which is again going on your mind says how do you recognize a bird by its name so do you have any any any, any route to understand this <laughs> the thing is that as we go on photographing we get and we are part of many of these bird groups birders mm -hmm. group so we would have seen some of the posts which have been uh, posted earlier so slowly we start getting to recognize these birds and once you are into depth of it and maybe the gender also can be uh, recognized in general the rule is that male birds are more beautiful than the female birds unlike the homo sapiens <laughs> oh so my goodness so you can recognize the male versus female in a bird he, he, it yeah, is his speciality <laughs> right okay dr prashant now how much time do you devote from your professional practice for this photography uh weekends most of the weekends for me i am very lucky because devran durga is just 7 uh, or 8 kilometers to me so every weekend i am there other than that uh, once in two months i try and go out to shoot uh, wherever uh, that time sighting is there great wonderful so can we have some questions from the audience in case if they have so that uh, we can, uh, philip is there he could he could answer or dr sir sopimath yeah. is there okay by the way i i am a canon guy i use uh, a 7d mark 2 canon body with a 100 uh, with a 150 600 uh, sigma sports and a 100 400 canon lens and i have a 18 uh, 280 wide angle lens as well these are the gears that i usually carry whenever i go on a wildlife safari so as as uh, philip was rightly say i wrote rightly said kabini is rocking and uh, uh, this morning we encountered five tigers yesterday last evening we had five and all five the mother with three cubs with the sub adult were together they were they were bathing in the pond they were enjoying their time moments and they were least bothered about us because we were intru intruders into their homes they were having their very own peaceful family time and i could spend more than 2 hours 2 hours with these tigers 2 hours so the, that is the amount of um, uh, the the happiness and delightful days that we get okay can we have some questions so that uh, philip could answer yeah arvin can i ask one question to philip please do please yeah yeah philip yep yeah i use uh, nowadays means uh, that is my first camera i'm using nikon p900 and uh, this is third year and i'm very comfortable with it my my question is do we have can we uh, have a medium range body and a high end lens is it compatible or we should have both the high ends or how is it like how do we go about for the slr Uh, awesome question, uh, Doctor Sanjeev. Basically, um, your P nine hundred firstly is an absolutely stunning bridge camera. I think it's one of the best yeah. bridge cameras to use because of the amazing zoom capabilities and the compactness of having a bridge Compact. camera, right? So it's it's something that most people who actually progress to DSLR says, "Hey, in my P nine hundred, I used to get even more zoom than this. What is up with the DSLR lenses?" But your question about choosing a, a basic camera body with a high end lens, will it be compatible? for sure so all uh, all your camera companies like nikon camera uh, canon and sony uh, they have different types of mounts okay now all your basic mounts are used basic camera bodies are something called crop sensor camera bodies o a a p s c camera bodies okay these camera bodies have an ability to mount your basic lenses as well as your high end full frame right. lenses so that's the beauty about these uh, these crop sensor camera bodies so likewise you can be see right now i have some a camera company Uh, a, a Nikon. It's a D five hundred. Now this is a crop sensor camera, and I have the ability to mount both a DX and an FX lens. So if I go and buy myself, say, uh, a, a, a cheaper two hundred to five hundred mm lens, which is considered quite a basic lens, it can it's compatible with this camera body. But at the same time, if I go and buy a six hundred mm f four, it's still compatible. So compatibility is not the issue. 
it's only when you uh, when you compare full frame camera bodies to to crop sensor camera bodies will you see a difference the sensor size being bigger in the full frame cameras is the big advantage so you have advantages like low light capabilities so for example if i increase my iso on these basic medium ca camera sensors can sensor, smaller camera sensors the iso performance is quite bright uh, you can see a lot of grains in your picture uh, you know you don't have as good dynamic range and of course because the pixel density is quite high um, uh, your you, your overall overall image is not as appealing in comparison to a full frame camera body but like you said um, compatibility like i said compatibility is not the issue it's just that the image quality compared to a full frame body will be slightly less well, uh, the practical the technical 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 The I mean, practical so, experience, uh, I think, one can get only during the safaris. I think probably with a mentor like you and the rest of the people. I think on spot when they see a subject, that's when they they hold a camera with their hand or the lens in their hand and they start shooting. I think photographing with you or someone, I mean, guiding them rightly. That's when they get the skills up, uploaded into 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 them. I think that that's one of the best way. Uh, and also i personally feel that initially rather than they going and buying a camera or a lens i think they should rent it out so if they rent it out they'll be able to understand which is better for them I, as you rightly said Pep, pepsi or a coke or maybe a nikon or a canon <laughs> i think they themselves can figure out and then slowly once they convert themselves in, in from amateur um, amateur to the pro probably they can go and invest for a camera because the cost is considerably high yes uh, professor uh, sorry much sir yeah, yeah please go i ahead. i just wanted to add i think he made a very beautiful comment philip right in the beginning that it, it, it just like buying your instruments so i think something like that we know that endoscopy is mm. they know very well a combination of processor and the scope though they are interchangeable when you best fit a best scope to the best processor you get the best image mm. so Absolutely. how to choose which one to choose that depends on the budget and what kind of work you want to do mm. and what kind of infrastructure you have and how much you love seeing that kind of i think it's just similar to that yeah. so okay. uh, sir uh, we are we are running out of yeah. time i think it's a past eight, i mean yeah. half past 9 now we need to end this so the final few I mean, final question to you philip so could you please uh, uh, tell the audience tell the audience the budget in case if they have to visit a national park and spend two days with four safaris and how much it may cost them so that up front they're aware so that you know they are prepared yeah so if you want to visit um, a premium tiger reserve like kabini or uh, say like banipur or visit any jungle lodges properties it's a bit uh, expensive for most uh, medium uh, families out there it's about 10000 rupees on average for a person a night Uh, which includes your meals your stay and your safaris okay so uh, basically you'll you'll get two safaris in the package you can do an evening safari when the day you arrive uh, which is from 3:30 till 6:30 and then the next morning safari between 6:30 and 9:30 along with that you get your accommodation now this is when i'm we're talking about 10000 rupees a night it's the most basic accommodation it's the tented cottages in a place like kabini and of course um the food is the same for every accommodation you have a buffet style food which is very good the spread is great you have uh, a choice of vegetarian and non vegetarian indian cuisine primarily and it's a very nice uh, overall feel to the property but like i said it's quite expensive for most uh, median families out there median income families so for people who are on a budget there are also some options you can stay in other lodges that surround the park and do a government safari now the government has these canter like vehicles or vans um and they they charge a much much more uh, affordable 500 rupees per person for the safari and uh, it's almost the same time if you go on a weekday this is one cool tip for you guys if you go on a weekday to either kabini or bandipur you get a 3 and a half hour safari just like uh, like if you stay in jungle lodges it's only if you go on a weekend that the uh, safari time gets reduced by half because they try to do two trips because the demand is more so if you're on a budget and you want to go and experience like a 3 hour safari paying that same 500 rupees go to daman katte book your ticket even now you can book it online and uh, go ahead and experience the safari if you're on a, on a on a tight budget but if you if you don't mind spending a little bit more and having peace of mind and going to a a, a really nice lodge with some great food then jungle lodge is your answer for all your uh, properties in in southern india um, uh, in in karnataka and of course in um, if you want to be on the budget the government vans work better 
for places like yeah. Ramnagar and Bandavgar, you can book your permit online, and then you can choose wherever you want to stay. So they're actually managing your um, safari is a little bit nicer because you can book your permit separately. You don't have to go to the lodge. Okay, I, I I think we have few questions. I uh, I think that I mean uh, is uh, uh, Avinash, are you there? Okay, please, sir, please go ahead. What's your question, sir? Uh, uh, Philip, you are just challenging. I have got two small questions. One is regarding the picture, vertical picture and horizontal picture. Will you highlight regarding the oblique picture? Sometimes we get oblique picture. If you give <laughs> circumstances, we get oblique picture. This is one question. The second question, have you come across the answer of these wild animals anytime in your life? <laughs> okay, so uh, when when I, I I know not sure if I got your first question, Doc. I'll come to your okay. second question first. Uh, the the second question is: Have I come across any anger in animals? So uh, one of the the most important things when you become a wildlife photographer is being ethical with your photography, not not going and trying to disturbing the animal too much. Now, generally, most animals they stay away from you. They try and get away from you. They're scared of you. Very very scared of you. It's only animals like the elephant. that sometimes show its temper towards you so there are many instances when you try and drive past a herd of elephants that they mock charge you and boy or oh boy dog i've been mock charged like a hundred times and they come <laughs> they come right at you ears all open uh, trumpeting coming right up to the vehicle and actually going down to like almost hit you uh, with their forehead like to try to push you down with the forehead and then back off so that's what's usually called a mock charge Touch wood. Thank God, I haven't really had a full charge so far. Where the I've seen some crazy videos where the elephant actually bombards the vehicle and smashes it and pushes it away and all that. Touch wood, that never happened. But I think the only animal that you need really be careful about on the safari is elephants. All your tigers, leopards, like ask Doctor Gubbi as well. They go about their own business. They don't even care uh, if they're habituated. If they're a shy animal, they will run away immediately. They're very scared of you. uh the first question i'm not sure if you can just repeat that once again over any of the other panelists can answer it oblique oblique view is like on an angle right angle left angle vertical and horizontal view is question is on oblique view oh so okay, okay. now i got it uh, so so generally um if you see like i said like i told you the beauty about photography is each of us have our own creativity so even though i spoke about rule of third sense space guys go out and just explore your creativity all of us have our inbuilt creativity so doctor if you feel that an oblique view image is very appealing to you go ahead and show it to the world it will be brilliant for us to see a new view as well because uh, like i said most of us have that sort of understanding where shoot like they shoot like that but i but i said that's why i like to teach a lot of kids because when i see kids photograph right they you know, they unleash their creativity like i've never seen in adults and the way they have perspectives on things etc is like what i so i really like that question and please go ahead doc if you feel that your image may look good in a right angle view or a left, or, or, or a oblique view please by all means use it now avinash has a beautiful question go ahead avinash ask him shoot your question फोटोग्राफीज <laughs> great question doc but uh, i don't think um, selfie and wildlife have any equal sort of understanding they they say they yes they say practice makes perfect so practicing your photography and using your camera getting used to the weight etc even at home will definitely benefit you when you go into into the wild like when i teach people focusing right i teach them how to change their focus point so i say you don't have to be in the forest to get good at focusing you can stay in your home look at the clock and say okay i want to keep the clock the clock and the rule of thirds to the right of the frame i'll move my focus point Then, when you come to the wild the next day, next morning, and you see a tiger, you want to place it the right. You'll remember how you place that clock in the same way. That will work for you. So yes, practice does make perfect. I'm pretty sure, as a doctor as well, the more and more and more of surgeries that you do, the better you guys get. Likewise, and even when you were learning how to drive, remember when you started learning to drive, you you would look at the gear and change it, and now it becomes like muscle memory. Likewise, guys, photography will become super easy for you. You don't even have to think twice; it'll just become like one uh, part and parcel of your enjoyment in the in the lap of nature. 
Great. One I, last I, question, I, please. Last question, please. I think we are running out of time. One last question. Yeah. Do you use any software for this type of photography? Because the background photography is so much more complicated. The focus is in the center, and the background is not there. So. I'm sorry, uh, I'm sorry, Doc, it was very muffled. I couldn't uh, sort of comprehend exactly what it was. Basically, what pictures you have saw, those are edited pictures or all edited pictures? Great, great question. So, um, all the pictures that you guys saw were edited in a way where I've done uh, something called normalization to the picture. Okay. So remember guys in editing, there are two very big headings to editing. One is called normalizing your picture to make your picture look how it was in the scene and giving it that oomph factor. The other uh, part of editing that a lot of people think is something called manipulation. Now as a wildlife photographer, I'm a very purist wildlife photographer. I'm not into digital art so much. So all the pictures that you saw have been edited, yes, in, in a software called Lightroom, just to bring back how the colors I saw in the, in the frame, bring back some of the contrast and give it a little bit of emphasis or a little bit of oomph to make it stand out. So yes, all the pictures that you saw were edited a little bit to give it that lovely oomph to the shot. But none of those images that you saw were manipulated. None of the images where I took one tiger in Bandipur and put it in bah, bah, Brigade Road. Okay, so I, I didn't do any of that, that kind of stuff. I didn't do any, any manipulation. All the pictures have been edited and that's very, very important to understand because remember our digital sensor in our camera is no way as close to your human eye with its capability. The human very, eye is unbelievable. We take it for granted every day. I tell all my, we take our human eye for granted every single day. But when you compare it to the capabilities of a camera, yes, cameras have good, better, better magnification. Cameras have the ability to zoom in, etc. But guys, when you look at color representation, when you look at dynamic range, et cetera, our human eye is something else. Until the day that a camera can replicate what the human eye can see with regards to colors and dynamic range, that's the day no picture will need editing. But right now, even if Rajni Khan takes a picture, he'll have to edit the picture. <laughs> <laughs> Wonderful. So thank you. Thank you, Philip. In fact, that was in nutshell, you gave us a brief outlook about the photography and its art. And so that many of us... Uh, yeah. I can can choose this as their hobby and and visit the places more frequent and you the your presentation was outstanding your pictures super, was super super, super beautiful yes, super. all right amazing yeah. incredible i think yeah. you have got most i mean many of the doctors have lauded uh, the pictures that you have uh, taken thank you so so very much i'm sure that i have made a right decision so guys and you have been friends in case if you have to reach out to philip Philip, what's your website and how, how should they reach out to you? So um, the website's called the Outback Experience. Uh, I don't know if I put it on the chat window if everyone can see it, but uh, it's very simple. Just type my name, Philip, with a double L, P-H-I, double L, I-P, Ross Photography, and you'll probably find out some link on online and you'll be able to contact me. But otherwise, my mobile number for anyone listening is double nine double zero one. 47018. Just pop me a WhatsApp message and I will uh, get, get, I'll answer your questions. I'll help you buy equipment and I'll help organize a beautiful tour for you as well. Yeah, because okay, the, awesome. the delegates the delegates are throughout from India for, because in Karnataka, they are all, most of them, they reach out to me because of late, every month I'm bringing, I mean, uh, the gastroenterologists <laughs> of Bengaluru, they're, they're accompanying Second me. House. I, I, every every visit, they're going back with a tiger. I mean, I mean the, the, the happiness of seeing a tiger. So yeah. likewise, throughout India, in case if they have to visit, I think, please, Philip, it's my request. Please help them out. I will support them. Totally. I'm very happy. Of my heart, I will. Don't worry. Okay? So, uh, thank you. And th thank the panelists, uh, Professor Dr. Sadashiv Sapimat, thank Dr. You, Sanjeev Kethi, and you, Dr. Prashant Pian for their, uh, yeah, for their thank you, everyone.